Hello, 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 guys. Welcome back to another episode of the Mortgage Marketing Podcast. I'm super excited. These are always, like I said, a highlight of my week to do. I have them in my diary. I've been prepping everything for you today. We've got a good one today. Very exciting show. We're going to unpack a ton of things for you so that you're going to be able to you know, stand out. And this is an exciting one to talk about. We've also got some good guests. So let's bring on and we'll explain what we're going to be covering today. So we've got the first subject, which is me, you know, my, my self-indulgent teaching moment for you. And that is three reasons your sales process is broken. Um, obviously, it's supposed to be divisive, but yeah, that's what we're going to be covering back. Just going to be breaking down these three things that you, three main reasons why your sales process as a broker might not be working as well as you think. And um, identifying kind of the, the structures underneath that and then talking about how ways you can fix it and stuff you could focus on to improve that over time. I like this specific one. It's 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 helped quite a few advisors I've worked with in the past and I wanted to share it with you. So we're going to unpack that. We're then joined by our guest this week, which is Adrian Benjamin, um, who is a protection advisor. And we brought him on the show. Um, he's doing, he's getting, getting like noticed quite well within the industry. He's getting a lot of recognition from other other um, providers and stuff like that so i wanted to bring him on and let him you know share his story he, he reached out to come onto the show and i think it's a good idea so he's come on here and share his story so you'll get to kind of meet uh, adrian and um, and you know learn more about him and and his his kind of ethos and, and approach to to social media and the, the business in general which is quite interesting and it's all about what what he would call he became he became his own brand and so um yeah, it's going to be it's an interesting interview. The one I think you'll find quite quite useful, and then the f third part, which normally, like I said, is a teaching part, and I have that kind of teaching element as well. But what I've found by doing this even more is that I think it's just better to have a just an episode takeaway where we review my lessons from my, my lessons, some stuff from the guest, and also just kind of just take take it away and have a little bit of a chat about it and just kind of talk about what's going on at the moment so i'm not not going to pack in this week and potentially it depends what's going on but this week there's there's a lot in the first two sections so and then and i think that's probably going to be the case moving forward it's just two sections and then a takeaway at the end which is just my conversational bit at the end talking about what i think is good bad and in the industry right now and whatever so that's what we're going to be doing we've got a great show for you super excited to dive into it so without further ado let's start you're listening to the Mortgage Marketing Podcast with Ash Borland, the show that helps mortgage brokers create impact and income by mastering content marketing. Let's, Let's dive, dive straight, straight into, into it. it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So let's do it. Um, I don't know why I went whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I always love chilling here. People who are watching this, if you're watching the video, um, I just like, this is one of my favorite times to just literally lean back in my very, very comfortable chair and just talk, which is great. Um, so we're going into the very first part of the episode. And this episode is, they like said, the teaching part. And it's this one, which is three reasons your sales process is broken. Now, I am a, a big believer in process. Anyone who knows me, knows i'm like the framework king of this stuff I, everything i do is by process i have adhd so without without having i have adhd and dyslexia so without having um, a process stuff doesn't get done and um one thing that's really important is is sales process and understanding these areas and one thing i've definitely noticed um, Oh, I've hit the wrong button. So with mortgages and protection, I was trying to trying to edit that there, but it didn't quite work. Um, so with mortgages and protection. Now, what I mean by that, um, and now we're back on the main track because I've been playing around with my buttons for a little bit. What I mean by that is that with a clear offer, if you know what your offer is, let's say you're a mortgage broker, your offer might be a mortgage, but it might be what, what you could refer to as a fully packaged mortgage, meaning a mortgage that has insurance, that has a will, that has like GI, that's a mortgage, like a, a fully packaged mortgage, potentially. Like that's the way you the way you create the offer. The, but but the mistake that people make is that they're trying to do multiple offers. I do mortgages, I do insurance, I do business insurance, I do, you know, limited company, buy to let mortgages. Like 
the offer gets very unclear. Instead, you want to think about with your with your like if you know with your sales process, you want to think about what is the thing they're coming to you for, and then your job then can move through. I'm a great example of this: is that most people come to me originally because they want help with their content marketing. I'm actually more of a mortgage, bro- not more of. I am a mortgage broker business coach. I help. I have most of my long term clients. I help them increase their fees in regards to improve their systems and processes, and live quite a. A, uh, and, and build a life that is built around being a personal brand where they make money and have a good work-life balance. That's the that's what I do, and that's my long-term clients. But that's not what I do with every client. That's what I eventually do because as part of the content marketing personal branding service, the mortgage marketing mastery service, it builds throughout that. The offer is what the person comes for. So packaging your offer around that is really important. Now with offers, you want to focus on outcome and you don't want to make the mistake. You Sorry, you want to focus on the outcome and you want to minimize, minimize the risk, okay? So you want to minimize the risk that for anything. Like So that's the stuff you've got to think about. You want to, you want to focus on the outcome and minimize the risk for your ideal client. Now if you're looking at trying to make a good offer, a great book to check out is Million Dollar Offers by Alex or Mosey. That will help you understand this literally breaks down offer into all like all of this in way more detail. Like it's super great. And last week's guest, Nicola Huxley, she actually used that book and and you and used it in her business for the for exact same reasons. Now the next one you have is no idea. This is all part of clarity. You have no idea of the audience. You have no idea of who the audience you are trying to reach. And I think this one is is quite quite crazy. So if you are, and, and this is again, mortgage brokers will often come to me with this and they'll talk about audience. And what they'll say is, I'll, I'll ask them who their ideal client. And they'll say, well, it's everyone. Anyone who needs a mortgage is my client. Now, this is so wrong, like so wrong, completely wrong. Y- you can't work with everybody. You have to have an ideal audience and an ideal client. So the best point with this, the best thing with, with audience and being clear on your audience is, think about it do your research now oftentimes and this is sometimes referred to as niche people get very caught up about it with niche they get very stressed about niche but like i need to make it very clear with niche is it's nowhere near as stressful as you think it doesn't need to be as 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 a problem as you think instead just think about first of all who do you like dealing with if you're because if i'm at this point like i'm i'm talking to people who have been advising for a while you've obviously got clients you've worked in a client bank who do you like dealing with who do so first of all who have you dealt with that's the first thing to look at so who this is the thing who have you dealt with look at that broad spectrum i promise you there's going to be a trend who do you like to deal with the most out of those people you've dealt with and then that's most likely your audience that's pretty much it then think about that and then think and then from there you just think what are their pain points what are their challenges what are their aspirations what are their goals of that so those those pain points challenges aspirations of the average i of the 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 most type of clients you deal with right now who you enjoy dealing with that's how you find your niche so to speak your ideal client your target audience whatever you want to call it that is how you find it it's not rocket science and i think a big mistake is being taught by a lot of people uh, in the industry and outside the industry but, but definitely in the industry is like pick a niche pick this niche of um my favorite one was like, I spoke to someone years about a year and a half ago and they were like, dentists, I want to be a working dentist. And I remember being in part of this coaching group and being like, well, do you, you know, do, do, you, do, you have, do you have connections to dentists? No. Have you ever worked with dentists? No. I said, like, why did you pick dentists? Because they've got a lot of money. Really? Like, that's an absolute no. Like, you're not, you're not, you've got no access to them. You can't make money off of people you don't have access to because to gain the access takes a long, long time. The niche, the audience is for you. You don't really pick your pick your audience. Your audience will pick you. I work with mortgage brokers not because I woke up one day and went, I know, I'll work with mortgage brokers. That's not what happened. What happened was as my career in property that moved into mortgages, that moved into, you know, like it was property that went into mortgages, that went into marketing, all of them took me down a path of working with mortgage advisors. That was it. And and what happened was I very much were I worked with a mentor and a coach and the guy was like, just just double down in the area you know. Look at your ideal clients, know their pain points, know their challenges, know their aspirations. Once you do that, by the way, you'll see with the clarity, if you're clear on that, your offer is going to get a lot clearer. You're going to be able to create an offer that's that's targeted to your ideal client's problems. Next one you have is not doing competitor research. 
your competitors aren't there for a reason. Now, one thing that's quite funny with competitor research people talk about is they there's this idea of like people get over over focused on their competitors. I see this happen a lot. Um, and that is something I, I don't want, you know, I don't want you to have that happen to you. But they also, when they get over over focused on their competitors, that's not a good thing. You don't want to be obsessed with your competitors, but you do want to do competitor research where possible. Because if you if you know, and competitors, by the way, are not people, your competitors are not mortgage brokers like everybody. Your competitor, once you're clear on your offer and your audience, your competitor would be who fits that, who is a similar type of offer to me and a similar audience to me. They are the people you want to be doing research on and, and tracking and, and analyzing. They're the people who you want to spend time watching, not just, you know, Joe Blog's mortgage down the road because they're a competitor and they're local. If they're not tapping into the same type of market as you as it, and, and the same offer as you they're not your right they're not they're nothing like you you know i could well, i could work with someone who specializes predominantly in first-time buyers and then I, well, I do and then i work with and i and i also work with people who, who this company that specializes one one of them specializes in working with f1 their, their entire niche is working with people from the f1 so like you know like like pit crew and everything that's their entire mortgage that's what they do they just work with people in the f1 that's an inter that's a very different niche. They're not even connected. They are so far apart. We are not even in the same realm. So to do competitor research and analysis on that is just stupid. But instead, focus on the people. If you know this, if there was another company that wanted to do F1, you'd think, okay, what are they doing? How are they doing it? Again, by the way, they got into F1 purely by accident, by a chain of they just they ended up working with lots and lots of different types of clients. We've had someone on the show before, mortgages for actors. He talked about that's Austin. He talked about that as well. He didn't just wake up and decide to work with actors. It happened over time. The ideal client, the niche, finds you. It's like Harry Potter's wand. So think about it like that. Now, when it comes to your competitors, things you can do, you can follow them on social media, engage with their content if you want to, to see how they, they, they work, download any lead magnets they have, sign up for any emailing lists. That's fine. Be on top of it. See what they're doing. Don't copy them, but just it's good to be plugged in to know what they're doing. The next one we have is no brand mission or value. So this is a really straightforward one with this. Why are you doing it? It's as simple as that. Like, why is it that you are, why are you, you know, cre you know, creating your brand? Like, why, what is the goal behind your brand as a broker? This is so overlooked. And the, and the amount of people that are like, oh, I just want to make money. I'm like, cool, that's fine. But you can make money doing anything. And then the, the, the question, there's normally like an absolute no for me when it comes to clients, when it comes to like discovery calls, when people are like, well, and, and, and I get it. I do, I do have people who say this and they're like, I, you know, I want to make money. I'm like, cool. Why do you do it? Well, it's just the best way to make money. I'm like, mm, it's not true. Like, you like that's not true. You, you, you're just not connected. You haven't connected to your real mission or vision or reason as to why it is. There'll be another reason, but you haven't quite thought about it. You know, I'm a massive, massive believer of living a life of purpose. That's I literally that's my entire. The reason I did this job was to live a life of purpose. The reason I everything I do, if you follow me on social media, is you know I'm up. I, I go to the gym every morning. I listen to audio books. I meditate. I, you know, I I do. Everything I do, I spend lots of time with my with my son. I'm very very present in his life as a child, and and you know I've got another one on the way, and that's the same thing. We're going to be very present with their, his or her life, and it's exactly the same thing. It's all about it's all about um, for me living a life of purpose. So knowing that, knowing what you what what I stand for and what I stand against helps me with my marketing. It helps me with my brand mission and value. You've got to think about it with yourself. What is it that you stand for? So that's pretty straightforward you know it's pretty straightforward like i stand like the great, great example with this what do i stand for i stand for um being able to create a brand that is so unanimous that there's you know, it's omnipresent that it creates a uh, passive lead generation that's my job my job i want mortgage advisors to not have to worry about where the next lead is coming from to create a brand large enough that it creates the, the uh, an abundance of leads to the point where you never ever worry about the next like paycheck that's my what what my brand stands for 
And it's done that by doing the, the hard work that others won't do. There's a reason why I work with a very select 22 clients. There's always 22 clients. And uh, like that was 30. We've gone even smaller with it. We've got, we've done some changes in the business and it's down 22 and that's the limit. No one else select for that specific reason. You see, because my offer is dialed in, my audience is dialed in. I, I, have very few competitors but i know what they're doing and then i know what i stand for it's exactly the same for you you have to think about it with yours it's exactly the same thing know what your brand is about which leads us to the second one which is your content is just not good enough this is another reason the second reason why your your kind of brand is you, you, your sales process is broken and not really working and it is that your content is just sadly not good good enough uh, and this is, it is, it's true. There's a lot of, and I see it on all the time. Like there's a lot of people I see who on social media, whose content is, well, um, <laughs> I'm just kind of like, have I got crickets? I don't think I have crickets on here. I think I got rid of it, but it's like, mm, yeah, it's not great. I was going to hit the cricket button, but I think I've got rid of the cricket button. Um, but yeah, like it's not good. It's not great. There's not much, there really isn't you know much to it so what do i mean by saying let's have a look at unpacking that a little bit more depth what i mean by the idea of the content isn't good so there are a number of things with the content not being good you've got first one being poor design truthfully poor design is probably all of them are pretty bad like all of them all of them that we have here but poor design is probably the first thing so if you don't have consistent colors a consistent font optimized for platforms and channels and the journey that the client goes through this is just really really basic 101 stuff i think i've spoken about this in depth a few times where i actually spoke about how one of my biggest things i see with mortgage advisors with their social media is there's, there's two extremes first extreme is that they just literally pick up a phone and they start recording there's no subtitles there's no form of any form of editing of, or, or some sort of pacing of any kind it's literally just they're pressing the button they're recording the phone they're, they're just recording a video and uploading it straight away and that's like right at the beginning and that's not good like it's better than nothing but it's not good and then you have the other extreme in regards to design which is where they end up they've obviously maybe downloaded CapCut, how to play around with CapCut, understood how to how to add stickers and gifs and stuff on t on instagram and they end up with this crazy overloaded visual like it's crazy so much stuff happening there's you know like a house jiggling around shaking it shaking around they've got text coming on the screen they've got um subtitles up in the left hand corner because there's the only space they can find and then the title across the bottom just looks horrendously bad and way too chaotic it's a really bad design choice you got to remember that more clarity simplicity there's, there's beauty and simplicity the simpler it looks the better the more effortless it looks it's why apple is probably one of the most successful well, is one of the most successful computing brands their, their products are just super simple and they're designed to look simple and designed for simple and ease of use it's exactly the same thing with your design so those are the two extremes i see if you ever look at my clients ones who worked with me for a long time we end up in the middle which is this very basic look it's very simple it's very easy to understand it's usually in a font of a color it's colored to whatever it is they're doing and it's very basic but it's this very important thing design is really 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 important if you have bad design, you will fail because it looks ugly and people don't like ugly things. They will just go somewhere else. They just will. They will, they'll, they'll scroll away. So, so it is quite bad. If your design isn't very good, you really do need to, to sort that out. The next one we have is um, not aligned with your buyer's journey. So your buyer's journey is, um, is is really important in fact it's probably the most important in the mastery program in the mortgage marketing mastery program which is my core coaching program it's literally the program i sell it's the one-to-one -one coaching what we talk about is this idea of client ideal client buying cycle and how long that average takes for a client this type of stuff is way more important than you would possibly imagine way 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 more important the amount of people who with their content they don't map it to what their client journey is going to be. So they're just, if you are just making content, you're going, I'm just going to make my content. Here's a list of videos. Just do this. That's not going to be good enough. you like, it'd be all right. Like it can be okay, but you're, you're not, you're, you're literally just going down a list. I'm just going to talk about this today. Talk about this today. You're reactive. You need to think about this. It's, it's a, it's all about a being part of a much bigger, much, much bigger like puzzle. 
And your client journey, you want a content, you know, your content should be mapped out to every stage for the whole thing. So you've got that awareness point, you have the nurture, you have the lead gen, and you have the convert. There are the four stages. Awareness is bringing awareness into you. Nurture is making them get to know you. Lead gen is when you actually make the, you actually turn them from somebody who is a follower into a prospect. And then convert is when you actually turn that prospect into a buyer. That's part of the content. And this is where you need to have good content that, that ticks every one of those boxes, which is why a omnipresent, multi-platform, multi-approach strategy, live streaming, podcasting, YouTube channel, TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, you know, carousels, stories, there's a reason why all of it is needed. Making videos on just one one a day, like, yeah, I'm going to make a video. That's fine, but you're missing out. If you're just doing the awareness and you don't have the nurture, you know, the lead gen and the convert, then you're missing a massive chunk of that puzzle. Very, big, big, big part. So very important that you don't make that mistake. Now, the next one we have with this is multiple CTAs. So very easy on this one. CTA is call to action. Multiple CTAs is that you really, you only want, you know, you want it to make it very obvious to your clients or your, to your prospects when they when you're going to get them to convert what you want them to do and the biggest thing with content like this and that is that their that their cta is all over the place i was on a profile a couple of days ago on instagram and i won't shout them out i won't give them you know call them out because it's not fair but like i was on them and and like very successful mortgage advisor does very well on instagram funny enough but there there they had like seven links in their in their instagram with, and telling people to do stuff and it was like check my file. It was like the, the home buyer downloading guide. There was all these things. It's like you create, you, you create more difficulty. The more CTAs you add one is best one product, one CTA, one server, like one offer, one service, the, the, the less you have, the better, the more you have, you will start to confuse people. And so with CTAs, really do limit them as much as you possibly can. Absolutely. Which brings to the next one and the final one for this one. I'm trying to get a little bit of speed on with here because we uh, we definitely, these are so in-depth. This one, it's fine. Not too much speed. I'll slow down. We can deal with it. You can always turn it off if you're bored. But this is, you shouldn't, you turn it off and you ain't going to be successful. <laughs> oh, you will. That's a lie. Um, I love recording these on a Friday. So the... Um, the next one you have on this is unoptimized profiles. Your profile is like the first thing a client sees. You know, does it position you as an authority? These are the questions. Is it focused? The questions for your unoptimized profile, it's very, very important. Does it focus on your ideal, like serving your audience? And does it position you as an authority? So what I mean by that is your profile. If your profile is literally like you saying like, and, and it's written like, like um, runner, got like, you know, gardener, like whatever on there. None of that stuff serves a purpose. It doesn't serve the purpose of, of, of does it position you as an authority and serve your audience? That filter should be through everything. Every post you make on social media should go through that. Does it serve my audience? Does it build my authority? And you can do this in like add personality through it and authenticity through it, but you shouldn't, you don't need to be like, the more, the, your profile should be optimized for business. And this is the mistake I see very many advisors make when it comes to their sales process in with the social selling online is if you're trying to make your sales process fit in to what I would say is, and this is, and it's pretty true. This is if you're trying to make it fit in to a, um, effectively like it's your personal profile and your business profile, you're kind of trying to straddle two horses and you can't do that. I don't have a personal profile. I don't really see the need. My personal life is my personal life. I share some personal things through my business profile that will enhance what it is I want people to see. So I might, you know, to show people I'm not a robot, like I'm a human, but I don't have a personal profile. I don't have the desire to, sh to post, you know, the bit of cake I ate yesterday or whatever. Like it's not, it's not relevant to my, it's not going to, you, you, not a single one of you listening to this or watching this is going to go, oh, Ash ate that carrot cake yesterday. I need to work with him. And yet I, I'm still you know, or like Ash, you know, watches, I don't, I'm not a big football supporter, but like Ash just watched Liverpool. I, I, I like football. I'm going to work with him. Like that is this myth that's sold around is like people buy from people, which is true. They do, but you don't pick your dentist because he likes the same football team as you. 
you pick your dentist because they're good at the job and then and you like them and you get to know them. Now, if they like the same football team as you, brilliant. That's more rapport, but it doesn't mean that there's a thing you pick. And it's the same with your profiles. Your profiles should demonstrate a level of authority with a level of personality through your your clients' audience's needs. And I think that that is a big, big mistake with this with this sales process in general. And that brings us on to the third part of this, these other three, and that is that you can't close sales properly. Now I don't mean this in a negative way. So but closing sales is a specific system and art to be able to do it. And the not not the vast majority, but a lot of mortgage brokers who I've who I know and have worked with over the years and been friends with over the years, quite a lot quite a lot of them can struggle with this because they they may not have come from a sales background. They may have came from a banking background. And um, sales is a whole different beast. You think I came from a, from a property, estate agency, new homes kind of background. So, like, I um, sales was never a problem. I've never struggled with sales. The um, the technical side of it in regards to the mortgage stuff, there's stuff that was where I was, like, needed to work on when I, when I first started as opposed to the sales side. And I normally find that advisors fall into one or two camps. So either really great salespeople, maybe not as technical, or they're very technical, but not maybe great salespeople. Our job, obviously, is to become both. And so you're good at both, but you always lean onto one side. Sales is always my strength over technicality, definitely, as, a, as an advisor, for sure. So what are those, what are the mistakes with these and how can we fix them? So very simply, quite easy really is this one is first one is lack of qualification now it's not lack of qualification in regards to um you're not qualified <laughs> but it's lack of qualification in regards to the leads might not be qualified properly if you don't have a qualification process for your leads then that's going to back clog up your your system your your your, your what's going to clog up your 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 work workflow massively so these are things, booking links like Calendly, there are others available, but Calendly is the one I recommend with clients, you know, to have this qualification process of like asking them questions. Do you know if they've got a prod deposit? Do you know? So when they're booking in and speaking to you, first of all, having a booking link requires them to have to make the effort, not you, which is, is, the, is the what you want. You don't want to have to make the effort with them. It sounds silly, but you don't. It should be from their own desire to want to get it sorted because when you do that, you, they're already being more qualified because they have their, they've got more urgency. People who aren't, who are not good and maybe not qualified enough, they are the people, and we've seen these, I'm just going to cross my legs on the chair, um, they are people, no joke, like the ones, we've all seen them, the ones who are like, oh yeah, well, just give me a call when you're free. Whenever someone sends me a message and says, Ash, can you just call me when you're like, you know, when you, when you when you're free, I'm like, no. <laughs> like, Book into my diary and I'll see you then. I remember this with a guy who was trying to work with me. Tried to see, I had a couple of calls with him and he was just like, can you call me? Oh, I finished work at 4.30 though, so I can't speak to you. And I was like, well, tough. You know, like that's a latter, that's just the way it is. It's part of the qualification process. You have to think about the qualification process in as much, be, and be strict with it as much as you possibly can. The more strict you are with the qualification process, the better you're going to get, the better results you're going to have. And, it, and and again, often overlooked. The next one you have is poor objection handling. So poor objection handling is a biggie. Um, you want to overcome them, you know, before they've really been asked. So, you know, this is really, really good, like really important, sorry, is that you need to make sure that you understand with that per that with that client understands. Um, sorry, you need to make sure that you overcome them before they've been asked. So keep a list. That's what I'm trying to say. Do the research. Think about it. You want to think. Do, do, like look at look at where you speak to. What are the ones that come up often? And then try and find ways within your sales pitch within your sales process to be able to address that first off. You know, there's loads of elements within that with 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 objection handling. And objection, by the way, doesn't always mean that it's going to be price. It can be anything. It could be I'm ready to go now. Whatever. Be able to find ways and seamlessly put them. And the more you can demonstrate empathy for objections, the better you'll win. You know, the amount of people who who these stupid sales things, and it's like, like I was watching a Grant Cardone thing a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, and he's like, you know, level of interest, hound them, hound them, don't do that. Like, learn what they're going to be. And again, if you do that stuff on the first one, if you understand your ideal client, you understand what you're doing, they're going to be the same. Like they're gonna be like you're gonna know when you know your ideal client, you know what your what your offer is, you know what your brand mission is. You know you're you're able to understand all of those things that offer brand mission and the ability to you know understand what your competitors are offering. You're going to then be able to navigate that quite easily because at that point 
you'll, you'll be able to, to, to address those object objections co properly and also be able to have the right qualification process to, to weed out the people who don't fit that, that target. So it's quite important, more important than people realize. The next one is undervaluing yourself. You know, if you're not closing properly, you're not closing the sales, you've got to know your worth and you've got to know what other people in your industry are charging around your worth. Big mistake I did with this. When I first started out many years ago doing this specific job, like we're helping mortgage brokers with their marketing, my fees were anchored to the idea of, of um, I'd been in the fitness industry and in the uh, performing arts industry before in regard, as, as a teacher at some points. Like I was, did some personal training and stuff. And I had anchored my, my price to that value not to what my competitors charged. And as I started to see what my competitors charged, and there was significantly more money than what I was charging at the time. Uh, obviously not the case anymore, but it's but it was then. The, knowing your value and knowing your industry's value is very important. So a mortgage is not, it's they're not created equally. And I think this is something that people get like lost with. If you're working with high net worth clients, you can charge more money. If you're working with, with specific clients, you have a specific problem, locum doctors who need this real big problem, which one of my clients, they can charge a lot more. You know, adverse adverse mortgages, a lot more. First time buyers might not be as much because they might not have the same amount. It's exactly the same thing, but you need to know what you're worth. And don't don't undervalue what you're worth because because of fear. Because actually lower fees will put more people off. The higher the fee, it's actually part of the qualification process. The better you'll get, you'll get better clients. And it will. And like I've worked with clients who have increased their fees significantly from like 300, 350 to like 900 to 1,000. Literally in the space of a year, we've got them to that point. I've done episodes on fees before. You should check those out if you if you haven't already. But th that is definitely, you need to know your value. And probably the final, well, not probably, the final one is follow-up, lack of follow-up. If you're not following up, you know, you need to set criteria and set reasons for follow up and deliver for that deliver value continuously afterwards. So if you're not following up with people, then you will, you know, follow up is an interesting one. You need to have a way of doing it that looks organic. Follow up very much can be a problem if you if it looks forced like there's nothing worse than hey just checking in to see how you're getting on or just wanted to drop by to see it's not that you've got to have like a reason and so sometimes you know i've i've worked with people where we've done this where we created follow-ups which are effectively like documents they can have afterwards or or like articles that are evergreen that we know you go oh, i just got this and i thought i saw this and was thinking of you i just wrote this and i thought of you or i was thinking about you today um and your situation and i thought this actually might be useful for you these are ways to follow up without actually having um, to, you know, to be like, how are you doing? Social media is a great one with this. Engaging with clients on social media through stories, through images of their children and their, their hobbies and their dogs and their food, all of that stuff. You writing comments, that's really great. How are you getting on? You know, engaging with them that way. It's follow up. It's part of the follow up process. It's, if you can, if you, but if you don't have that, then people will, you will just get forgotten. Like you will get forgotten. And I'm a sucker for this. I'm not saying that I'm some sort of perfect person to this. This has happened to me many times where I will forget to follow up and I, you see it over a couple of months, how it starts to become irrelevant. And then you go, okay, that person's gone. But I have also, I'm pretty good with follow up and with, with that and staying in touch. And the ones that I do keep coming back again and again and again and again. So it's very important to, to prioritize follow up. Now, that is, those are the, the three, like I said, they are the, the three reasons that your sales process, your social selling process as a broker might be broken. They might not be working as well as you would think. It's a big one, this one, today's episode. You can see why I haven't got another section. And that's because it's very in-depth. Now, I would highly recommend you do do check this, you know, check that out in, in a lot more detail because because it's, um, it's, it's yeah, it's just very, 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 important it's very important to go through that if you follow those and you go through those things and you fix those problems you'll you'll see much more success which is really useful now coming up next what we've got now we've got our interview so we we're joined by adrian benjamin so um adrian you know reached out to me wanted to come on the show um and i was happy to oblige to that i have met adrian once before and it was the first time i it was our first proper conversation really we'd had a we'd had a call a, a, a couple of months ago about six months ago but um 
this is my first interest. He's had got an interesting approach to how he does his, his, his business and his branding. And I think that it was, you know, he wanted to share it with you. And I think it's important that we, that we have a listen to it and see what, and, and, and be, and, you know, show how he's built his brand over the last few, few years, like about year, 18 months to two years. Um, he, you know, he's, he's done from all accounts. It seems to be doing really, really well. So let's, let's, um, let's dive into it and have the interview with Adrian. Let's do it. Pardon the interruption, but we wanted to make sure that you follow Ash on Instagram for exclusive and behind the scenes content. Now, back to the show. Hello, Adrian. Welcome to the show, mate. Thank you for having me here. Very honored to be here. You've got an illustrious list of people that have been on, so I'm happy I can now say I've been on the podcast now. For everyone who is listening to this, watching this, just give us a bit of a background as to who you are, just a bit of an overview so that we get the context where this conversation is probably going to go. Originally from Manchester, I know the accent's not there anymore, been down south a little bit too long. Previously done recruitment, investment banking, corporate banking, consulting, and then the cliche term fell into protection, primarily during COVID, self-employed. And yeah, just from a stand and start, just managed to grow and grow it. And I'm passionate about not just educating clients, but people that want to, you know, learn more about protection, whether it be a mortgage broker or a protection advisor as well, because... What we're going to touch on later in social media has really helped me um, as a brand and a business. So yeah, you can come from a background that's got nothing to do with protection and, and do really well in it. What drew you into protection? Why protection specifically? Yeah, so I, I've been contracting in the city for about four or five years. I got, got sick of it. So I set up my own property company on the side. And my property company was basically finding investment properties all over the UK for investors. And the common thing, obviously, property is massive in the UK. Investors want uh, rental income, capital appreciation, and then pass it down to the family and protecting the asset, not just houses, but other things. No one has a clue how to do the third thing. Like, no one. And I'm on the property circuit big, as you've seen, all over the UK. I speak in Bristol, Birmingham, Manchester, wherever. No one knows how to do that. And because I've got the banking background of they look at risks first, profit second is just trying to get that across to the client basically so I thought you know what I, I studied for my mortgage qualification so I've got CMAP but the protection bit really stood out to me because I'm like if I've been in financial services my whole career and no one's told me really about life insurance I've had it already because my mum told me to do it so I was like I don't want to argue it with me but I didn't really understand it you know I mean? it wasn't written into trust no one told me what a trust is so I'm thinking my stuff isn't in trust so I've obviously put my own stuff in trust but educating people that it's not really scary and i think it's just it's a lot about perception yeah protection is not scary it's, it's not sexy it's not glamorous but it's important and everyone needs it so that's why I've, I've chosen that path and I'm, I'm happy that i've chosen it do you work a lot with people in the property sector now is that kind of your main niche yeah so i've been in the property circuit about four or five years so progressive property is the biggest property trainer in the uk so i've done training with them i've done simon zucci da dr daniel moses i'm now a sponsor of him as well as him being my client so when it comes to property in the UK, I know pretty much all the, the main hitters really, but it's getting that message across to people like, yes, you have a property portfolio, but if you were to pass away and the, something happens with tenants, you're liable and all that hard work you spent paying for the property, the lender's going to repossess it. So my job is just basically say, look, my job is to make sure the property stays in the family. That's basically it. It's not, it, it, you'd think it'd be straightforward. Sometimes they're not grasping it. And I'm like, look, you put 25% deposit down, you're not getting that back. If you've got a limited company, the tenant can pay that life insurance policy for you. It's called relevant life. So these are things that can help landlords and business owners. It's just, again, it's the awareness bit is key and that social media is really important for me. Before we move into social media, the stuff you're, you're saying here is quite niche. It's very specific. It's very like, it's property landlords. You're in that circuit. You understand that world. How was that? Is that the, sorry, is that the pr primary clients you deal with? Is that all your clients are from the property kind of circuit and you deal with landlords or do you deal generic clients as well? It's a split. It's probably 50% property people, 50% normal. And I'm moving more into business insurance because again, mm -hmm. not a lot of people sell that. Speaking to all the insurance providers, it's pretty much 1% of insurance revenue is business, which is scary because there's so many SMEs or one man, one woman bands that just don't know that they need to protect themselves, whether not just life, but income protection is a big one. Are you relevant? Your limited company director, 
executive income protection, you get 60% of your income compared to 60 if you were just a normal employee. So it's a big difference. It's an allowable business expense. So it's going to help you lower your corporation tax, whatever that's going to be. And again, it's just, I'm going to keep on, I'm going to say awareness is my key word, but yeah. if you don't know, you don't know. And I didn't know the importance of all these products. I didn't know what income protection was or family income benefit, but I just put the small videos out online where people can digest it in their own time and people reach out to you and they, they become clients off the back of it. You actually have done a lot of focus on building a brand, building a personal brand specifically. When did it come clear to you that a personal brand was something that you wanted to have and or would be advantageous in your line of work? I just think it's how the way the world is like over COVID. So many, we were all locked inside on Instagram, Facebook, whatever. And I just saw these people doing amazing things. I'm like, why can't I? And yeah, insurance protection, it's not sexy, not glamorous, but you've got to put your own spin on it. You've got to make it about you. So I think with the people want to be their own brand, I would say just, I know it's cliche, just be you, don't copy anyone. Like Carla is crazy. She's doing an amazing job and I shout out to her. That's just not me. Do you know what I mean? I'm just how I am. And my, my clients like that. You're to the point. That's what you talk about. You're not rocking the boat. They enjoy that. And whatever people want to do. If you're, we talked before, if you're big into dogs, you could be the dog mortgage broker. And if you brand that, that's a massive niche. Yeah. Cause everyone's going to need a mortgage at some point. And if you like dogs, you've got something to talk about. My passion is property. So I can have a conversation with anyone about how it works and they're going to need the insurance anyway. So my advice is if you're going to be a builder brand, make it as original as you can. Like, cause I see people copying a lot on, especially on LinkedIn. I've got people copying my videos like word for word, but it's, you've got to be your own person, put your own spin on it. Cause everyone's going to know who's done it first. Right. With me, when I came up with my videos, I just wanted to be professional. That's my brand. So I made sure they were edited. I made sure they had subtitles. I made sure I've got a landline number. It's not a mobile. I've got a real email address, all these little things that people weren't doing. And that was, that's the brand really. What was your understanding of social media when you first started? And has that changed? i am be honest. I hated social media. I'm a private person. I was like, there's no way in hell. My girlfriend helps me with the, taking videos. I'm not good at it. <laughs> I'm not good at social media, but I'm like, I have to do this because I want to build a business. I want to build a brand and it's cliche. You've got to be comfortable doing the uncomfortable, doing a video, messing it up, editing all these things, all these platforms, but then it just becomes second nature. What am I going to post? I'm stuck. But now it's like going to the gym and having a personal trainer with you and you advise your clients. They hate it at first. It's weird. They don't want to do it, but you're there for accountability. That's why you're good at what you're doing. You need someone who's experienced. And then now they're killing it. They don't, and they graduate. They don't need you anymore. They're doing their own thing and they can help other people. And that's what social media is. But I think because we're in a regulated environment, so many people don't understand it. But for, for my story last year, I went from no clients, nothing to being a rising star from the cover magazine, which is, is very big in protection. I think it's the biggest one in the industry to being a guest speaker. I spoke about Carla. I'm on stage with Carla. You know what I mean? It's me, her, Robin Allen, and I think Emma Astley, four people, We've got three women, all from different backgrounds, myself as well. We're one of the, we're the best advisors in the whole of the UK. So say everyone's got the same story. It's just getting out of your comfort zone, putting the work in, speaking to your compliance team saying, is this okay for me to put out? Cause you don't want to annoy anyone compliance saying it's okay. And then off you go. We are all doing really well um, with our businesses, but yeah, we just put the work in and, and try not to be scared. So and I think you as well, having a mentor and a coach is so important. You every week you tell your stories, like just do what you say and your business will grow. And I'm big into sports. I've never had a personal trainer. Over COVID, I got fat ash. Dude, I was huge, mate. I was eating biscuits all the time. I'm like, we're not going out. I've put on loads of weight. I've been in the gym since I was like 12. I got a personal trainer. I paid, I think I paid like 1,200, 1,500, which I thought was ridiculous. Like you've got YouTube. I paid the money and I lost the weight. Yeah. I got the results. And I put it, it's all on my LinkedIn, Facebook. I paid the money for the trainer and I got the results. So that's why it's important. What is your strategy top level look like right now? Yeah, I think because when I first started on um, Instagram and LinkedIn, I think 18 months ago, I was like, I don't know, maybe from watching the Yeezy thing or Last Dance, I'm, like, I'm a document everything, like good and bad and legit. The first day I started work at my new company, I documented everything. So anyone can go back and look retrospectively of, oh, he went to this event. Oh, he knows this person. Oh, he knows that person. And I just did it consistently. I know you're a coach. I don't post every day. 
the reason why, because sometimes I feel some people can get sick of you and they might mute you. I know some advisors or some coaches say, no, you have to post every day algorithm, blah, blah. I don't do that. So because I don't have the pressure of seven days every week posting, I'll maybe do three, four, maybe even two. The odd week I might not post. I don't have that pressure, but at least I put out something. So again, it's all, it's organic. It's a journey from, look, from nothing. So I, I also won the, the Dr. Marinus Barnard Award from Scottish Widows. Mm-hmm. I'd never even heard about that award, Ash. Like I got emailed like three weeks before. I didn't understand the magnitude of it until we went to the NED. And then you're seeing all these senior people from all these like regulatory bodies and stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, I just post videos. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm just looking like me with the heads of banks and stuff. I was like, this is mad. But, and the reason, with your point about strategy, the reason why I prefer LinkedIn over any other platform is because the industry can see you. Because some of those senior people, they're not on Instagram, they're not on Facebook, they're not on TikTok. I strategically use LinkedIn more big and also my managers can see what I'm doing. If ever I do something that's out of bounds, which I haven't done, they'll message me, let me know, do delete it and it, I'll just delete it. But if I'm getting awards for it, they leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. they, just to ask some questions with, with that, you're saying LinkedIn is really good for the industry to see it, which makes sense for me because I work within the industry. Let's say you're a broker, you're, you're an insurance broker, a mortgage broker. So all of the, the banks, the people that are seeing you, what about the actual people who are going to pay you for the business? Yeah. Playing devil's advocate, it's what everyone listening to this will go. Is that's great that all of the people are going to schmooze and give awards, which is wicked. Yeah. Does it generate? We know that Facebook, TikTok, Instagram bring in tons of business. So does LinkedIn also do that as well as project you to the industry? Hang out where your clients hang out. So again, limited company directors, they're going to be on LinkedIn. I've got a big following as well, nearly 14,000 followers on LinkedIn mm-hmm. as well. So out of those 40,000, there are a lot of clients. I can like, you post a video, you get a DM, you've got a client, 30 seconds work. You can literally make money from a 30 second video explaining what a product does. That's how powerful it is. The reason why I specifically said LinkedIn is I know full well, MDs and CEOs are not hanging out on TikTok because they don't even know what it is. So I put it on LinkedIn so they see it and future clients can see it as well. It's an interesting concept. So let's move into coaching. You also have now started a coaching practice. Tell me about what it is so we can all understand. Yeah. So again, the irony of this podcast is off the back of everything that's happened the past 18 months, I've got people messaging me before I was like, I'm just focused on the business. I just want to build. But because so many people kept on messaging me at different stages, oh, can you help me with this? It doesn't necessarily have to be social media. It could be actually, how do you approach clients networking as well? It's not one thing so that's why i'm like look everyone keeps on asking me for help i might as well just do it if everyone messaging me on facebook instagram like, oh can you help me out with this and that okay fine i'll, I'll put some structures to it because it's all well and good sometimes when you do a sales role where your your boss will say do this and do that but i'm not being funny if you've done it 20 30 years ago it's not going to hit correctly with me i'm like i did this 18 months ago you've been doing this for 18 months how long did it take for you to start to see some results from this yeah I'll probably say maybe nine to 12 when I think I was getting clients anyway, but it's sporadic. It wasn't like my, all my portfolio is all social. It's a mix. But I think when I was getting the awards from the industry, that's when I was like, okay, this is serious now. Okay. And then I've done other things as well. I've, I've done protection training for next gen planners. So they're a company that help finance professionals through IFAs, people doing wills and trusts. So I've done their finance training as well. So off the back of that, I've done that. And now the consulting thing as well. So when you've got other people not in the industry that want you to do it, and I spoke at their international conference, yeah, no, two days ago. So now people know me in America, South Africa, it's a whole different level to how it was 18 mm. months ago. My tagline is be a brand, don't be an advisor. There are thousands and thousands of advisors. How do you stand out from everyone else? How do you differentiate yourself? Carla's brand is completely different to mine or Matt Chapman. We're all different. We all have the same message. You all want to look after clients and do the best thing, but we're just, we're all different people and that's fine. And that's okay. And that's the beauty of having a brand. You can do it however you, you want to do it. And it's whatever you stand for. You don't know what you're going to get. And then it gets so big. You're like, whoa, like I didn't expect to win an award for my company. Then Scottish widows give me one. And now I'm speaking internationally all about the same thing. I've not changed yeah. anything. I'm not, I'm never going to change. So my point is, yeah, just be consistent. I would say have a. I'm a kind of, uh, you know, really driven person. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have a coach. I'm just doing this. 
I'm just making it be consistent. Like, there wasn't no real plan and structure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you. So there, is, there we have Adrian today. Like that was like yes yeah, so adrian's got some good stuff going on um i'll bring up his instagram his linkedin sorry because he talks about his linkedin a lot in the show so his linkedin is here and um yeah as he said he's he's, he's coming in at around 14 and point fourteen thousand two hundred and sixty five followers at the moment and you know i've seen him around i've seen him being he's been on quite a few industry podcasts he's done some stuff with vitality which is pretty cool so it's definitely interesting and, and and i think a good like interview to to understand how someone has gone from like not being in the industry to in 18 months to you know as he says a lot well as he says you know winning a lot of awards and stuff he's doing he you know he he seems to be getting a lot of recognition within the industry and i think that's really really good so definitely if you want to connect with adrian go and check him out it's adrian benjamin cmap on linkedin he's also all over social media he's on instagram he's on everywhere else um and he'll be tagged as well on the episode on instagram so if you want to go and find him um go and check him out because he's he's doing some good stuff and it's definitely worth checking out we wanted to interrupt the show to make sure that you're subscribed to the YouTube channel for all the best mortgage marketing content. Search for Ash Borland and subscribe now. Back to the show. We are back in. So this is the episode today. We're going to be now talking about the episode takeaway. To be completely honest with you, uh, this is a long episode, but it's good. It's not long. It's about the same time. Um, the idea, as you can see, what I wanted to say, like it's it's is is that you know make sure that you are following if you are you know an advisor and you're struggling with your sales stuff make sure you follow that stuff that i've done at the beginning because it definitely will help it definitely will help i also wanted to say and um just to get a couple of shout outs first of all shout out to nicola huxley um who was last week's guest and also a client of mine um and the reason i'm shouting out is that just as i'm recording this it came up and said that she had been she's now been shortlisted for the protection guru awards for um best use of social media um, video social media by an advisor so um, we'll be following that closely see where she, she, how she does it but i wanted to give a massive shout out to her because you know, you've seen it the work she was putting in last week she was uh, amazing to have on and the feedback has been great so just shout out to her the other thing i wanted to say in regards to episode takeaways for this one and not so much just kind of my my, my ref reflection on a lot of different things is i know it's tough right now guys um with what's going on with the interest rates and um it's pretty tough and it's pretty brutal right now out there for a lot for a lot of you and and you know i'm very much plugged into this industry this has been my this industry has been my industry for nearly a decade well over a decade now and property and finance has been and, and we grew up with it with my dad um so it, it, i feel your pain and um if anyone is just wants to vent or anything please feel free to just drop me a message or whatever on instagram i'm called to chat with that you know and talk about it because i'm always interested but one thing i would say is i think that one one thing that's very apparent to me right now is that it seems to be tough but it's the people who can be resilient who are going to win and um and i say this to my clients the stuff i'm going to say now is what normally this is why there was no real ending in today's because the stuff I would say to my clients, I wanted to share with you as all, because you're my, my, my listeners and I value you all very, very much, is that I believe in your ability and don't get your, let yourself get down. My wife said something great to me a couple of weeks ago when we were chatting about this, a few weeks ago, just before it even went crazy. The swaps were just starting to move, so it would be around that. And, and I said, she said, don't let external factors like, you know, deter you from your own internal missions and goals and as silly as that sounds what she was saying she said she said you know like we we're talking about stuff and she said you know it, like you're doing all the right things the the economy the climate might be different but it, but you can't control that so don't so just keep doing what you're doing it will correct and so and like i spoke to some advisors who you know who are absolutely crushing it still and i have spoke to some advisors who aren't and they're quite quiet and i think it's niche specific but i just want to let you know like you're not alone uh, in regards to like you're not alone and if you can talk about it I'm, I'm actually going for, for lunch with you know with some bro some good brokers who are who are, who are like industry brilliant like legends um in a couple of weeks and and we and i think that's probably where the conversation will go to but it's very much like keep keep going you know don't don't give up because it's in times like this where it can feel hard and it really can it really can feel hard and i think that you know the the, the this is where like I remember seeing this guy talk about this where he was like 
it's when you're on your knees. It's the whole Rocky thing, but you know, it was a member's guy saying when you're on your knees, that's when the, the resilience kicks in. So if you're out there, you're, you're slogging away, you're making these changes, and you're not getting the, the return you want, keep going because the market will correct. It will. And, um, and I'll still be here. So pl- I would love that you're all here still as well because the last thing I want to see is people leaving the industry, buying leads because and spending money on that. Like I'm not building the brand they want and over with short term goals in mind. So stay strong, guys. Keep going. Um, it's a tough one, but we'll all pull through. Anyway, have a wonderful week. If you have any questions at all, like I say, drop me a message on Instagram. And um, yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Bye. You've been listening to the Mortgage Marketing Podcast with Ash Borland. If you've enjoyed the show, then be sure to leave a review and share it with a friend right now.